This is the current federal tax developments for the week of January the 18th, 2021. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers. I'm broadcasting this week from Phoenix, Arizona. And we're going to look this week again at actual tax developments. We're going to take a break from, you know, we've been on and off the last few weeks on issues related to the PPP loan program. This week, we will actually go back to good old standalone standard tax developments this week. So if you'd like to go back that way, we'll be there. These are developments that essentially have occurred since the beginning of the year. And what we're going to look at this week for our topics, well, they're going to include the first issue will be a case of an amount that were advanced by a partner to a partnership. He was a money guy. And we had this treated as if it was debt. So the issue became because the other partners who had not contributed anything to the partnership needed some basis. So we'll talk about what happens when we get to the end of the line on this partnership and what problems ended up occurring and how the partnership tried unsuccessfully to deal with those problems. We also have the IRS giving some relief for employers who are valuing the employer use of a company car using the auto lease valuation rules. We'll talk about some relief on that because of some of the impact of COVID-19 and various employers having offices shut down for an extended period of time. And also not just that, but customers and other people having offices shut down, which resulted in less business travel. So we'll deal with that issue. We're going to talk about the final regulations issued for the qualified plan loan offset rules this week. We'll also talk about the IRS getting a very late start this year to accepting electronically filed returns, that being pushed back all the way to February 12th. And finally, the opening nationwide of voluntary access for taxpayers to the IP PIN security program. Well, let's go ahead, though, and go first to our main topic this week. And that, not main topic, I say, but our first development, a court case. We always like those. This is the case of Michael Hollett versus Commissioner, Tax Court Memorandum Decision 2021-5, it was issued on January the 13th of 2021. In this particular case, we have three partners who contributed no assets to a brand new partnership. These three partners were the idea people, which means that they kind of knew what exact, what in essence, how to run the business in theory, supposedly how to make money. And I say supposedly because as we'll discover, making money was not what this partnership was very good at. But they didn't have any assets to put in, or at least they didn't put them in. We had a second partner who, or I should say a fourth partner. This guy put real money in, right? And when the partnership had trouble in operations, they kept going back to him to borrow money. Now, despite the fact that only one partner had put money in, they actually treated this as a 30, 30, 30, 10% partnership with the money guy only having the 10% interest. The three partners who contributed nothing, they got guaranteed payments for their interests and ended up, therefore, each with 30% of the losses allocated. Now, of course, starting with no payments, no amounts being paid in by these partners, there was a fundamental problem if they were going to be claiming the losses this thing was generating. That is, they had no basis. But what they decided to do was we're going to go ahead and we're going to treat the advances by the money guy as debt. So they were recorded on the partnership as debt. They were reflected on the K-1s of each partner, an allocable share, which was deemed to be recourse debt that each partner had allocated their account. And that allowed the other partners to claim losses, even though they had never put a dollar in. So they were picking up the guaranteed payment, which were actual cash they got in pocket, and they were then turning around and claiming losses against that. Now, of course, all good things have to come to an end, or more importantly, eventually the guy putting money in gets tired of putting money in and is not going to subsidize it anymore. So in 2012, the partnership ceased operations. In that year, on the final K-1, they actually indicated they still left the debt. All of, every year, the partnership had shown these advances from partner four as debt owed by the partnership to the partner. But in that last year, interestingly enough, 
They didn't show any allocation on any of the partner's K-1s. And they still left that, though, on the Schedule L. Now, when push came to shove, they would end up claiming that, well, really it was an advance, a capital advance. It wasn't really a loan. And they did that because the IRS, not surprisingly, said, wait, we think there's been cancellation of debt. As a practical matter, I would say even if it wasn't cancellation of debt, there is a little problem that we have these losses that have been claimed. And if we end up losing the debt allocated, which is what the K-1s were showing, we would have had a deemed distribution in excess of basis. So that also would have been a problem. But not surprisingly, the partners, at least two of the three um, partners who just got guaranteed payments, because they're the only two involved in this case, they went ahead and treated the amounts as nothing happening that final year. No income, no loss, nothing happening, didn't report anything. Well, the IRS said, guys, this is, this is cancellation of indebtedness income, right? Even though you left it on the balance sheet, it's not, you know, there's no assets left to pay the debt with. It's like realistically here, you know, there is no longer a realistic expectation that the partner who loaned money to the partnership is going to be repaid. And, you know, and that person is not seeking collection from anybody. So bottom line, it would seem to be COD income. And as I said, frankly, in my view, even if we say it's not, and it was converted over to capital of the contributing partner, there seems to be a basis issue here. Well, the taxpayers had a couple of defenses on this point. First, of course, as I said, they said, oh, no, 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 that, that was all capital. It's not real debt. So we couldn't possibly have cancellation of debt income. Now, my own take on that was, well, I guess it's a little bit better if that had been the real tra- situation, if it actually been converted to capital, really converted, which would be a whole other question about why it would be really converted that last year. But then we would convert it over to capital gain, you know, as opposed to since it'd be a distribution in excess of basis. So therefore a capital gain at the very final year because of the loss of the debt. But it still wouldn't have gotten you out of the income entirely. But they also had a second defense. And they said, well, oh, okay, but, but see, even if there is a deemed distribution, well, our, you know, our guaranteed payments end up you know, creating basis. Well, the tax court didn't buy any of these arguments. First thing they said was, A, look, it's clearly a debt. You've always treated it as a debt. It was meant to be repaid from profitable operations. That's what had been said in earlier years. Obviously, now there's no longer a profitable operation. So first thing, it was a debt, right? We're not buying this convenient theory that it was a contribution of capital. You know, secondly, we're taking the position that it was canceled in 2012. They said there were operations in the partnership through 2011. It clearly was intended to be repaid from profitable operations. And only in 2012, when we stopped operating, was it clear that there would be no profitable operations, right? The taxpayers said, well, yeah, but you know, but you've had these cases before and you tell us that, you know, if, if there wasn't a realistic expectation of repayment and a note wasn't written and all these things happened, that it wasn't a real debt. Well, the first problem is, I think, as most everybody figures out, when you go to court telling the, ta- telling the tax court that you've effectively been lying would be your position on the tax returns in prior years, the court will not be positively disposed in your position. They will take your listing of it on the tax return as your acknowledgement it's a debt, which they effectively did. And they're also likely to be very, very skeptical of the evidence you now produce. Evidence that effectively says, because we didn't do everything right, uh, this is not a debt. That's a position the IRS will win, That's not a position the taxpayer is going to win, especially when they've been relying upon it as debt, right? So that was the issue. Then we get to category three problem, which is, okay, if there's cancellation of debt, how do we allocate the income? Now, the operating agreement for the LLC did have some rules in it that told us how we were supposed to distribute income and allocate income that was based on each partner's capital account balance under 704B which obviously the three that put nothing in would have had zero. Well, the judge says very, very clearly the partnership was not paying attention to that. He therefore held that in reality, 
that partnership agreement had no substantial economic effect. And he went back and said, what about their interest in the partnership? And he finally ended up ruling that effectively you had cancellation of debt necessary to bring your capital account back to zero. What about the basis issues? I mean, we had all these guaranteed payment. Don't they add the basis? And the court said, no, 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 they don't. They do not add to your basis in the partnership. Rather, they're an expense of the partnership. And you're, mis- you're misinterpreting provisions that, you know, that describe it that says they're not like distributions and all of those issues. They said, no, in reality, they're really not like anything. They're a guaranteed payment. They're effectively the equivalent of what would be paid on a W-2 if we were a corporation. And for that reason, they don't add the basis. All you ever had as a basis adjustment were the negative adjustments. Therefore, you know, we end up with that negative tax basis capital account. And the court found that that was probably the best way to describe your economic interest was, in, in essence, to get you back to zero in the account. That's a cancellation of debt income. He also didn't pay attention to the arguments that one of some of the partners made that, oh, well, I, I was insolvent. You know, court noted there was no evidence presented of their insolvency. There was a little worksheet they did, but no backup evidence for it. So he didn't worry about that. Now, that does illustrate a point. The insolvency route could work, but it has to be a partner, not a partnership level insolvency. In an S corporation, we'd be looking at the entity level. Because obviously this partnership's insolvent, but the question is, were the individual partners? So at the end of the day, this partnership ended up with cancellation of debt income. It's a good illustration of be careful when you magically change your interpretation of a situation where there's no obvious reason why things would have changed, but you do it primarily to gain a tax benefit by changing your view in just the perfect year to maximize it. Courts don't like that. Taxpayers tend to lose when they do that. Well, let's go on next to notice 2021-7, which was issued on the 4th of January. This particular case, or this particular rule, takes a look at the valuation of personal use of an employer-provided auto. And the catch this year is looking at some of the impact of the auto lease valuation rule. Normally, that's the default rule we use when valuing a car we're providing to an employee. And the way that works, let's assume that we don't pay for gas. We go to the IRS's tables and roughly find the lease value on the first year we give the employee access to the car, right? And we have, and it only works if we expect the car to be primarily used for business. So we give access there, and then what we turn around and figure out that lease value, which is deemed to be, you know, how much would you pay to lease that type of car at that cost for a four-year lease? And for four years, we use that as our base for valuation. So let's say that our lease valuation was $5,000, and we had 20% personal use. Well, that would tell us that we had $1,000 personal use because a thousand is one fifth of the lease value. Now, if you actually have auto, if you actually have fuel as well, we add on 5.5 cents per mile. Well, the problem this year is pretty straightforward when we got into COVID. So what happened was the ruling says for 2020 effective on March 12th, which is the day we had the declaration of a national emergency for COVID. An employer can decide, if otherwise eligible, to switch the employee over to the cents per mile method. Now, the cents per mile method does have one caveat. You have to have a car that, at least at this year, is worth no more than $50,000 for hundred. That used to be a lot lower, but we changed that after TCJ raised the uh, auto limitations. If you do that, then we use the annual mileage rate, right? Our standard business mileage rate to value the personal use. The idea being, let's say that in a normal year, you know, the taxpayer would have, or the employee would have driven the car 25,000 miles in total 
and 20,000 of those would have been for business. So we would have had 5,000 personal miles. But let's say due to shutting the office down with COVID-19 issues and then our customers also having closed offices. So this salesperson, instead of visiting the customers now, has been holding Zoom calls and phone calls and everything except doing on-site visits. Well, then our problem becomes that, you know, what we very well may see this year is that they only drove the car in total 4,000 miles, but 3,500 of those miles were personal. Only 500 miles went in for business, or at least after May 12th or after March 12th, that was what happened. Well, that would put a huge portion of the car on the W-2 because we would have the vast majority of use would have been personal. So we would have now had a much larger add-on because let's say 70% of the use was now personal because we had no business use after mid-March. The catch is, while that's true, we actually didn't have an increase of actual personal use. We just had a COVID-19 related decrease in business use. Well, because of that, they're saying beginning on March 12th, you can go ahead. So you're going to do a partial allocation each way, but you can go ahead and on March 12th, start using the mileage only to assign the personal use. So we can do that. Now, if you do that this year, there's another neat thing. Normally, you cannot change. You know, if you use value, if you use the valuation rule, the least valuation rule, you're not allowed to use mileage and vice versa. You start using mileage rule, you can't switch to least valuation rule. But they said this year, we're going to make an exception. If you've done the swap this year, now in 2021, you, you can choose to go either way going forward. But whatever you choose in 21 now does become the default and what you have to stick with. So in 21, we can go back to using the lease valuation rule, or we can turn around and start using the cents per mile rule from this day forward, moving forward. Now that might make sense to make that swap. You have to kind of run the numbers and see what would happen. But you very well may have had a car that when we first gave it to them, you know, would have been above the 50,400 limitation. But now when we swapped it in 2020, it was worth less than that. So this would allow us to swap that going forward. But again, this is a COVID relief provision. Will it be extended? There's always a possibility they'll open this up again in 21. Again, at least as of today, the COVID numbers, especially here in Arizona, are looking pretty bad. How long will that continue in 21? Tough to say if we get to February 1st and everything's gone fine, the world's working great and the COVID thing seems to be dying off everywhere, you know, then probably won't get it. If we're sitting well into the year before we see this change, I wouldn't be surprised to see this continued on in the future and this relief popping in for 2021 as well. The IRS finalized some regulations we had talked about a couple weeks ago or actually a few weeks ago, this is Treasury Decision 9937 that came out on uh, January 5th, get the right date out there, that came out with the special rules added by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act put a special rule in to deal with a situation that we often run into and always created issues that we only discovered when the clients brought in their tax materials You know, you had a client who's an employee of another company, not a business you work with, but it's a client, you know, one of those individual only clients. They come in and they bring their stuff in and you're saying, okay, W2, oh, you got a new job this year and you went from this company to this company. Okay, that's fine. And and then you finally get by. So you get a 1099R from the old employer's retirement plan. And it shows, you know, Total distribution of $300,000, 350000 you know, shows you 30, 300000 of it was a direct rollover into another plan. Okay, that's great. But 50000 is taxable. And so you start asking, well, you know, it says 50000 wasn't rolled over. And I said, no, 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 I, I rolled everything over. And so your next question becomes, did you have a loan? Well, yeah, yeah, I, I had a loan. It's like, did you pay it off? No, I, 
I didn't give any money to pay it off. They're saying, well, then here's your problem. That 50000 represents the offset of the loan you had from the plan before you left. And that's taxable to you. Well, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, realizing that people in that situation rarely even understood they needed to come out of pocket with fifty grand to complete the rollover if they didn't want to pay tax, put a special rule in that says you're allowed to, through the due date of the return, for the year following the receipt of such a plan offset distribution related to your termination, uh, you are able to put that into a IRA account and treat that as a completed rollover. Well, there are only very minor modifications that were made to the proposed rules we discussed earlier. In fact, it's kind of amusing. They decided to give a break by delaying the effective date. Now, I say delaying needs to go in quotes here because by the time this finally got out, in reality, they would have given you more time had they kept the old uh, effective date rather than the new one. But what they did, they modified this. The original proposed reg said it would be effective for any distributions on or after the date the regulations were published in the Federal Register. Well, the final regs changed that to say it would be effective for distributions on or after January 1st, 2021. Okay. The only problem is if you take a look at the date the regs were published, they were published four days later than that, so this effectively is retroactive. Um. Obviously, that wasn't the attention, but by the time the OMB got through rule, you know, OIRA got through reviewing it and we finally got it published in the Federal Register. Yeah, we were after January 1st anyway. So mechanically, you probably just want to kind of ignore that, right? Uh, You're going to treat it. Anything in 2021 is going to be subject to these new rules and distributions in 2020 are not. Right. So basically, it's kind of interesting. Now, remember, under these rules, the offset only works if the offset is solely due to plan termination. We talked about the proposed rules, which went in basically unchanged. If you had an offset, let's say you already were behind in payments before you left. Well, that offset is not solely due to termination because you had payments you had made up. So that would not be a qualifying rollover distribution or, you know, plan offset distribution. Also, the rules told us that any offset had to take place within one year after year of separation. So we know that also stays in the rules. But there was one very nice thing in the proposed rules that remain in the final. Let's say your client comes in now in February or has your Zoom meeting, right? And uploads the data so you see this 1099 and you're having your zoom meeting to discuss what happened and your client comes in and you discover here's that fifty thousand dollars well what you can tell the client now is basically like i said you know you've got until the end of the extended due date of your return even if we go ahead and file your return by april 15th and even if we don't get an extension first so i can go ahead file their return, not include the 50 grand as income, treat it as rolled over, even though the actual rollover does not going to be completed, not going to put the money in because they're raising it until the end of October. So, you know, it, it's kind of an interesting ploy, an interesting thing to do. That very much was nicer than we thought. Most of us thought you would have to do an extension to get that extra time. The IRS decided we don't really want more extensions on our hands. So, you know, we're going to go ahead and work with this. So in any event, those rules go in now basically unchanged. Okay, if you're not aware, the IRS has been, shall we say, behind a bit. Uh, I don't have it in the materials this week, but the Taxpayers Advocate Service gave its annual report. And one of the reports they had was that we had over, they had over 7 million 2019 income tax returns, individual returns, that had that were not yet processed as of December 31st, 2020. The IRS is way behind, and we keep adding things for the service to do. So this week we got news that I called because uh, I was interviewed by CNBC uh, for a online post, and I kind of referred to it in my discussion with the uh, with the reporter as being disappointing, but not surprising. 
we got a notice on the 15th of January. This is just on Friday that the 2021 filing season electronically will begin on February 12th. Actually, both do because IRS won't process paper returns until they start the electronic systems going. And the electronic systems will come online on February 12th. Now, the reasons for this are kind of obvious when you think about it. First thing is, obviously, we've had some major changes to the law that took place effective December 27th. Right? Remember, December 27th, the new law comes in. Uh, we have this new provisions, things that affect the 2020 return. We also had, don't forget, as part of that, the IRS also had to get busy on updating the programming for the computers to get out the second round of rebate payments, all of which had to be issued by that by January 15th. So by the way, we're, we're after the date. If a payment was not issued by Friday, now it might be mailed out as a check, which means it'll come much later. But if it hadn't come out by Friday, your client's going to have to get that refund on the 2020 return by claiming the credit. If for whatever reason their payment wasn't processed by then, we're kind of stuck. The only real exception uh, is actually for those, if anybody's here listening to this one from one of the U.S. territories, you're in a mirror code jurisdiction. And you know if you are, if, you know, if when I say that magic word that you're a mirror code jur- jurisdiction like Guam or the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, they actually have until potentially September 15th to get the checks out. Uh, it depends on Treasury and what Treasury decides, what they decide, but they might have more time. But those here in the, you know, in any of the states, the actual 50 states or the District of Columbia, uh, you're basically stuck with, you had to have it by January 15th or the payment's not coming. Now, as I say, remember, this is a 2020. I've had this question too. This is a 2020 prepayment. So we reconcile on the 20 returns. Some people said, but we didn't get the payment until 21. Doesn't it go on 21? Doesn't it reconcile 21? No. No, it's a 2020 reconciliation item because it's a prepayment of a credit. Separate and apart from the first prepayment of a credit. Again, it reduces the credit, but not below zero. Uh, What about the proposed $1,400 payment? Have to wait for language there and see if they're going to try to add that on to 2020, assuming it passes, or if they're going to delay that to 21 because of how late in the year that would end up coming. I mean, it's the 15th was picked for the obvious reason that people are going to be filing returns, and what they don't want or what they didn't want was to have that situation occur and then turn around and discover that people had to file amended returns. Of course, it's going to be February 12th. Maybe it wasn't such a big deal. We could have gone a lot later, but we can't right now. So those electronically filed returns began being accepted on the 12th of February. Now, as e-filers, you know, those of us who are, you know, basically we're filing on behalf, we're going to be return transmitters, uh, you know, or going to be electronic return originators, I should say, not transmitters, EROs. We can go ahead and prepare returns. We, We can essentially... This is the one exception where we can inventory returns, right? Remember, generally, once you get authorization, you're supposed to transmit in three days. This is an exception to the inventory rule. Uh, You're allowed to hold them until such time as the IRS accepts transmission, which is on February 12th. Now, you'll have to check with your vendor to see if they will let you load them up before February 12th, and they will transmit on that date, or whether you have to actually wait for February 12th before they will let you send them up to their location to be held for transmission. I think a lot of them will let you basically get ahead and put them in there. But you will have to tell your clients that nothing's going to be processed till February 12th, and therefore their refunds are going to come after February 12th. And expect quite a rush on February 12th. So, you know, they're expecting two to three weeks maximum with electronic. They are strongly recommending that you do not file on paper unless there's no other option. The reason is those 7.1 million returns. You know, they are way behind. They're not really catching up, you know, in essence. So what's probably going to happen here is they're going to end this tax season also way behind on processing paper returns. In fact, we'll have to see how long it takes them to finish up the 19s. My guess is they're going to finish up the 19s before they do the 20s. 
So if you have one of those clients who is, you know, one of those, well, if we're going to file paper because if we file electronic, they know everything and they're going to data mine me and it's going to cost me tax. It's like, okay, but don't call me. Do not call me two months later and ask where your refund is because your refund is going to be held an extremely long period of time. That's reality. If you don't like it, call your congressman, call your senator. But I'm telling you right now, that's almost certainly what's going to happen this year. And not much is going to solve that problem. So if you want your money quicker, you better pay, you better file electronically. And to be totally honest, it's probably safest to pay electronically. Again, the IRS has had some real trouble. Yes, they've had trouble with payments, getting a pl- even electronic payments, not necessarily getting posted right. But the number of electronic payment glitches I know of is very low compared to the paper ones, which seem almost every case they blew that. They would cash the check, but then they would somehow not get it properly linked up. Uh, so the electronic, it would get posted. It would just get cashed. So apparently they were cashing the checks, but holding the vouchers. So like I say, electronically paying is probably the better way to go. Well, the IRS also announced on the 12th, a little bit earlier, they're expanding nationwide the Identity Protection PIN program. They're going to have a nationwide expansion of the IP PIN. The IP PIN is a security program, right? So before your return can be processed, if you get an IP PIN, you have to give this four-digit number in addition to your social security number. If you don't give the four-digit number, your return will be rejected electronically. You can still file on paper without providing it, but if you don't provide this number on a paper filed return, and there's a spot to do it on the paper return, then your return is going to take a long time to process. And we're already telling you about how long it's going to take for paper returns anyway. These paper returns are going to take way longer. Now, originally, the IRS invented the IP PIN program to deal with taxpayers who had been victims of identity theft, right? Tax-related ID theft refund fraud. So if you had a client that did that, they would go through the program, they would resolve the refund fraud for the year in question, and then they would give them an IP PIN for the next year, which they had to provide. Shortly after that, they did expand it some to high-risk areas, areas that had the highest number of returns that were fraudulent, uh, which, on, which was kind of interesting. We discovered that Tampa, Florida is number one in this area, at least at that time they were. Uh, and the suspicion was it was it was close enough to the Caribbean to be a nice moneymaker uh, for certain drug cartels. And Tampa, Florida has a lot of retirees who get sick, die, and you could kind of bribe certain, shall we say, not well-paid healthcare employees to provide you with that information. And guess what? People that have died don't complain very quickly about their IDs being stolen. So yeah, it was kind of interesting how that went. Well, they began expanding that to other areas, right? So we saw that in other states. And last year, it was actually in a pretty good number of states. This year, though, it has now gone nationwide. Now let's talk about the program and the pros and cons. The pro is it does lock your return. So bottom line, no return can be filed without this PIN. So if an identity thief has your name and address and social and even has, let's say, even a transcript of your returns, so they know the right employers to put down, the right other things, they just need to modify the bank account to get the things routed to something they control they still won't be able to file the return. They'll have to go through, at best, the paper system, which is going to probably cause contact to be made back with the real taxpayer. So it pretty much shuts down, or at least theoretically should, the ability of those parties to steal identities. So that sounds like it's all good, and it is pretty good, but here's the downside. First thing is, to get it, your client has got to be able to establish a secure access account with the IRS. That means the taxpayer is going to have to answer those crazy questions about what was your car payment four years ago? You know, which address had you lived in? That one I can usually get. But, you know, they start asking random questions about car payments. It's like, "Mm, what was that car payment? You know, all of those odd things they may ask you about. 
And there are a good number of people will not be able to create, will not be able to complete those questionnaires. They do have a way to you still go through. If you can't do that, there is a way to do it on paper if your income is below certain levels. So you can do that and they'll contact you. If your income's too high for that, or you have other issues, you have to schedule an appointment at the IRS offices and go in person to prove your identity. But here's the real hitch. Remember, we can't file the return without the number, so clients have got to hold on to that number. The number is issued directly online if you do it the online method. So they have to remember to save that number the minute they get it, not just forget and go by and say, okay, that's great, I can retrieve that later, right? Nope, not really. Finally, uh, they need to you know, provide that to the preparer. They are told only provide it to a person preparing a return for you, so hopefully they remember to do it only that way because there are probably going to be attempts at phishing that number. Uh, including by people that will claim to be with the IRS. We're going to try to fish that number from them. Uh, but the real problem is if the client decides, oh, I lost it, I don't want to do it, uh, I'm, I'm just going to go online and get out of it, you can't get out of the program. Now, the reason why is pretty obvious. If you could get out, the identity thieves would go ahead and for everybody, pretend to be the person who doesn't want to use anymore and wants to get out and you know get it turned off and then they could file a fraudulent return. But clients need to understand that there is no way out after going in. So it's a really good program. It will definitely protect the returns. It will definitely protect the returns from ID theft. But they now become absolutely required to retain that ID number and provide it to you when you go to try to file the return. If that doesn't happen, we have problems. Well, this has been the current federal tax developments this week. We're going to talk, you know, going for over all the weird things that happened in the week. I am still, uh, pay, you know, doing work on the Connect site for Arizona, New Jersey, uh, Minnesota, Illinois, shall we say, doing those, uh, take a look at those states. So I do check in there. If you have some questions and you post something there, I'll try to come through with it. I am going to be doing some updates this week uh, on the PPP loan program. I am doing a session this week for the Virgin Islands, U.S. Virgin Islands Society. I'm going to be doing a session on this, the new law. I'll also be doing a second session uh, for the Arizona Society of CPAs. So we'll be working on that this week. So again, either of those, you can check in uh, and see about signing up. They obviously will both be webinars, uh, which is you know, kind of sad because it's really nice in U.S. Virgin Islands right now, but I'm not going to be there. Somebody sitting here, you know, in Phoenix, it's not bad in Phoenix right now, but you know, it's not the U S Virgin Islands sitting out there by the sea and, you know, having your breakfast outside in the morning this time of year, which is all kind of nice. Uh, that's not happening this time here in Phoenix, obviously webcast as well. And you go to the Arizona society website and you can see about signing up. Uh, we'll be looking at doing some others probably, We'll see how we go with others in the future. Obviously, we're going to keep our eye on, is there going to be a new law once we change administrations this week? We know that the incoming president has a proposal. Uh, if that proposal turns to law, or at least parts of it, and any of those have tax issues, we'll talk about those when they would come up. But otherwise, we're just looking at getting yet another week into January. And with our delayed start to tax season, well, you know, we got a few other things to do in the interim. We still got to get rid of those employee retention credit refunds. So, you know, we got something to do at least till the end of January. So take care, uh, keep safe, and we will uh, see you here next week on current federal tax developments.